Uh, welcome back uh, to the afternoon session. Um, we're going to uh, get right into it, and we're going to start with a talk by uh, John Crocker from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, John has been, a, a, again, a personal inspiration to me. Uh, I followed in uh, many of his footsteps uh, along the field of Freud. Uh, most recently, he's been working on problems in uh, self-assembly and trying to hijack some of the machinery that biology provides. Uh, to do that and essentially create a macroscopic habit. So with that, uh, Thanks, Itai. Um, I'm grateful for being here, and I've really been enjoying the session so far. Uh, I think I'm going to learn a lot. Um, what I'm going to talk about isn't really origami per se, but I think you'll agree when I'm done that it's informed by origami concepts. Um, I'm going to talk about two different things, because 20 minutes is so much time. I'm going to talk about two separate projects. One is the self-assembly of three-dimensional ordered colloidal crystals uh, from DNA-covered microspheres and by self-assembly. And the other one is using sort of a more of a fabrication type technique uh, for making sort of biomorphs from DNA-covered gold nanoparticles. So you could ask the question, well, why would we want to use DNA as sort of a building material? Um, and the answer is this, okay, that I could basically use DNA as a smart glue to bind things together. And this is not my idea. It's been around for 20 years, 20 plus years. Uh, the idea being that if I have two kinds of microscopic particles and I put the right kind of DNA on them, if the, if the ends of those DNAs are complementary, they'll spontaneously form a double helix sticking them together. It sounds so simple in the cartoon. Um, and then a nice, a nice feature of that, of that process of forming a double helix, which you all know the DNA is a double helix, is that if I heat this helix up, it'll fall apart into two separate single strands. Um, and if you're older, perhaps, and you didn't have a lot of molecular biology in school, uh, this is reversible. So if I cool the system back down, this thing will happily go zip right back into the double strand. Um, and if I sit at a temperature called the melting temperature, the system will jump back and forth between these two states um, hundreds or thousands of times per second. Okay? So what I want to do is I don't want to use this as smart glue. I want to go sit near that melting temperature. Okay? So when these particles come near each other, they reach out with their little tentacles and they shake hands. Right? Because if I went to low temperature and this was irreversible, they would stick together and bind. And then I would make a gel. Right? If I want to make a crystal, I have to be able to anneal. And so I'm going to sit at this temperature where these things are doing this handshaking interaction. And then the particles should feel, in some sense, like an engineered colloidal force, okay, just pulling them together reversibly. And, and that will drive my crystallization. Um, so I think I said all of this. But the other nice thing about DNA is there's all kinds of DNA tricks. Okay? There's DNA nanotechnology. Uh, there's various kinds of enzymes that I can break out. There's a thing called DNA strand exchange reaction. Um, and that'll be handy as we go on. Um, but the question for the first half of the talk is, what crystals can I make? What three-dimensional crystals can I make with this technology um, with the idea that eventually we could make 3D photonic or phononic metamaterials with those? But I'm not going to tell you about that. Um, so the, the background on this is lots of groups, including us, have been making various kinds of three-dimensional structures uh, by this method. And more relevant for what I'm doing today, back in 2012, we made some crystals that had a symmetry that we didn't expect. We found all these crystals. It turns out that they're a copper-gold one structure. Um, and it took us a while to figure out how they formed, and eventually we figured out that what was happening is the system was forming one structure, and then over time that structure was transforming by something called a, metensitic, a, met, a martensitic phase transition into the structure we saw. Okay, so that was kind of cool. We didn't really expect these colloidal crystals covered in DNA to have that transformability characteristic. Um, and then since then we've been exploring the fact that we can engineer the potential and we can turn things on and off and reprogram the interaction um, to do sort of hierarchical assembly of still more structures. All right, but the basic building block I'm going to be using is a polyball. It's a polymer microsphere, about 300 to 500 nanometers in size. You can see it under a light microscope, but only blurrily, with several thousand DNAs on their surface. And they're just single-stranded DNAs with those sticky ends. Um, and then 50T means 50 thymine bases, okay, just as we use as a flexible spacer. Um, and then schematically, we would describe the interactions with this box, and we'd say, oh, a red sticks to a blue, and a blue sticks to a red. But when two reds come together or two blues come together, there's no interaction. Okay, so that's our, that's our toy periodic table okay, of two elements. Um, and if we want to get cute and we want to make this a little bit more interesting, we could make a sphere which is mostly red DNA with a little bit of blue DNA, or mostly blue DNA with a little bit of red DNA. And then when a mostly red and a mostly red come together, there would be an interaction. It would just be a lot weaker than when a mostly blue and a mostly red come together. So now I've got two mixing parameters on my mostly red and my mostly blue bead, and now I can independently adjust the strength of this interaction and this interaction relative to those. And then that'll give me some knobs to turn to form different structures. All right? um, so just to give you an idea about how we do this, we take those spheres, 
And we don't know exactly what temperature that handshaking happens, so we just take a little test tube of those spheres at a 20% volume fraction, and we put it in a beaker of hot water, and we go get lunch. Okay? And then as the beaker cools off, eventually that handshaking process starts to happen. The colloidal spheres dynamically self-assemble into little crystallites. Um, and then as the temperature continues to cool, that binding reaction becomes irreversible. And I get these nice little stable crystals. And then this tumbling is the Brownian motion of the entire crystallite. Okay, so I made a thing that contains like thousands of individual building blocks that have assembled into a structure which I know is cesium chloride or BCC, and then these are the facets of a rhombic dodecahedral faceted sphere, okay? And the whole thing is only about five microns across, so it tumbles around by Brownian motion. All right. Um, now, if I wanted to do some crystallography on that, I would want to sort of slow it down and stop that tumbling. So what I usually do is I enzymatically ligate the DNAs together, I put it in some sort of mounting medium, the same things the biologists use to mount their cells so that nothing moves, and then I can throw it on a confocal scanner and I can actually visualize the whole crystal in three dimensions, okay? And my Z resolution isn't really great, but it's good enough that I can still figure out what the three-dimensional crystal structure is with a little bit of work, which I don't have time to tell you about, okay? So just to kind of start um, simple, um, I have a lot of knobs. I have all those interaction knobs I told you. Another knob is size ratio. The, the green and red spheres don't have to be the same size, okay? So I can, if I make the, the A spheres a little bit smaller than the B spheres, like that size ratio, 0.85, it still makes the same structure. It makes 0.85, it makes cesium chloride, uh, which I would render that way. And this is like a BCC lattice, where every other atom is the different species. Um, and if I make this ratio lower, so there's a bigger size contrast, then it makes crystals that are the sodium chloride structure, okay? And so that's simple cubic, okay? So the red and greens, if I sort of look at that lattice, it would actually self-assemble a simple cubic lattice uh, with alternating atoms on the different locations, okay? And of course, these are all just isomorphic to the atomic structures. And I guess, you know, it kind of makes sense to me because an, an, an ionic crystal is kind of held together by electrostatics, which is kind of omnidirectional. There's no um, bond directionality in an ionic crystal, so it kind of makes sense physically that these are the kinds of crystal structures that we would make. Um, but one of the things that's kind of important is that these structures are not mechanically rigid. Okay, they're floppy. So I can take, uh, I can make a mechanical model of these things with some sort of interaction potential model that I've validated, um, and I can calculate um, its dynamical matrix, or its Hessian, and I can do a mode analysis on that. And what I find out is that there's all kinds of ways of deforming these crystals that have no energy penalty. Okay, so they're kind of like those magnetic sphere toys where you can make like a little crystal and you can kind of shear it. It's the microscopic equivalent of that. So I could, I could grab either of these crystals and I could deform it many different ways without any resistance, any energetic resistance. Um, and that's because, as I already said, the interactions are isotropic. Um, and if I do that, I actually find that there aren't like one or two or five. I find that like crystallites as the sizes I've drawn have thousands of zero modes. Okay, so they're very floppy. All right. So now what we want to do is we want to say, okay, well, let's go away from this boring interaction matrix where A sticks to B and nothing else happens. And what if we make it so that the bigs stick to the bigs? Then maybe as it's flopping around, it'll transform into some other state so that the bigs touch each other. And we'll see what it makes. Um, so if we do that and we make a system where we add a little bit of the green DNA onto the B particles, so I have a little bit of BB interaction, and I make up a sample and I go get lunch and I come back, uh, there's six different crystallites six different crystal structures in that sample. So that's nuts, okay, because they always tell us, oh, the system's gonna form the system that the structure that has the lowest free energy. Okay, in the other sample, it just made one. It made one kind of crystal, and now in this sample, I have six. Okay, so then I have to get up my pencil and do a lot of crystallography, and so I figure out, oh, well, this is the season chloride I showed you before. This is something like what I saw before in the other paper, the copper gold FCC, uh, and then I get these two, two related structures called iridium vanadide. Weird, that's what it makes. And then there are two things that I can't recognize. All right, so I talk to my simulation colleagues, see if they can help me out, um, and they say, oh, if I run a simulation of this, an all atom simulation or some sort of deformation model, um, I get a funny state that the student likes to call pseudo close packed, and I still don't know why he calls it that. Um, and then this is a dead ringer for that structure. So it spontaneously transforms into that. And we're like, well, I only see a few of these. Why, that, why is that? And he's like, oh, because that's an intermediate and this thing turns into iridium vanadide, okay? And it can turn into one of two, it has two different pathways. So the cesium chloride turns into this, which then turns into that. And I have a few of these, like I did before, but it goes directly through a different pathway. So this is like, when, in the earlier talk, we were hearing about, I have some singular state, okay, that's highly symmetric, 
And then there's many pathways out to many other sort of transform structures. This is the system finding three different pathways to three different end states that all have the same energy. Okay, so that's a little weird. Um, and then we're left with the mystery of what's that thing. Um, so we went and we thought and thought and thought and we figured out it was something called double diamond or B32. Um, and it, so it's two interpenetrating diamond lattices, a diamond lattice of red and a diamond lattice of green that looks like that. And for various reasons, this can't be something that comes out of cesium chloride. So that frustrated us for a while and I sent the poor student back to do more crystal, more, to look at more crystals. And he said, oh yeah, there are, some there are some sodium chloride crystals in there. Like two out of like 800. Okay, he took 800 scans and he, saw, he found two of these sodium chloride crystals where they didn't belong. We didn't expect to see them. And then the simulation people says, oh yeah, that thing happily turns into this. And sometimes it turns into that. It turns into cesium chloride. So in this crazy phase diagram of seven different structures, six of them new, um, we don't even know if the cesium chloride structures we have form from solution or if they form from something like that. Um, so, so the punchline, which isn't really a very satisfying punchline, is that this is crazy, okay? Because we heard about these sort of single degree of freedom origami structures where there's just one way the system can deform. These are not single degree of freedom origami structures. And yet each of these systems, which have thousands of different zero modes, pick one or two, and then they transform along those pathways. And we don't know why that is, but in the language of this meeting, we'd say, oh, there must be some kinematics, okay, at the particle-particle contacts that determines how they deform. So that's the first half. Um, so I think you've sort of seen some of these things before. So the idea is, okay, so talking about hydrogel micro-origami, uh, I can make all different kinds of structures and I can activate them by light or pH or temperature, or I could like put little pressure transducers in them. And you know, I can make all kinds of fun movies, not me, but other people. Um, but what I really wanted to know was, um, can I, come on, can I take sort of all that cool technology I had here with the DNA handshaking and the DNA nanotechnology and apply it to sort of like a hydrogel origami system. Come on. Um, and so this is a picture of a bimorph, and we saw some bimorphs earlier from Mark. Um, and the idea is I just have differential expansion on the two layers, okay? But the way this usually works, they can only usually bend one way, okay? I have one actuator. And what I was really wanted to do is I say, okay, if I want a robot, forget about origami for a second, if I want a robot, a robot has multiple actuators that can be moved independently. So it can move it around some sort of multidimensional um, operating space, okay, of actuation. And so if I'm just using pH or temperature, I can't get like 17 different orthogonal actuations, right? Um, and so the simplest thing we would do, because it's a postdoc and he's only around for a little while, is to make a two orthogonal actuation system. So we made a funny kind of bimorph where we can independently expand and contract both layers. So if we expand one layer, like the green layer, it turns into this. If we uh, expand the blue layer, it turns into that. And so I have two flat states that are different and two curved states. And I can kind of move around this two-dimensional actuation diagram, okay? Um, and of course, we're gonna use DNA to get these orthogonal actuations. Um, and so we're gonna switch our building blocks away from those polymer spheres onto gold nanoparticles that are about 12 nanometers in diameter, again, with short synthetic DNAs on the ends. Um, and again, we use a poly A spacer here with some sort of sequence on the end. And now we design these colorful helices such that they don't interact with each other. And we make these things stick together through a yellow linker DNA, right? So I make something that's complementary to red and complementary to blue. And I add that strand to a mixture of red and blue and it sticks them together, okay? And here we're in the irreversible regime. So we're just using this as glue. But the nice thing is because we're using this linker architecture, we can stick any one of these building blocks to any one of the other building blocks. Okay, so we get a little bit of design freedom there. Um, and the way we do the assembly to make a film is we use layer by layer assembly, right? So we take our building blocks in suspension, these little red tubes, and we take some substrate and we dip it in there and we say, start it out with green. We rinse off the excess greens. We dip it in blue with some linker that sticks the blue to the green. So we form a bilayer. The blue doesn't stick to blue, the green doesn't stick to green. So we form a green layer and then a blue layer on top. And then we just sort of cycle back and forth, dip, 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 okay, until we build up a bunch of these little bilayers. And then we can build up a different set of structures from a different building blocks on top of that, okay? Um, and of course we use a robot for that um, because it's a little <coughs> tedious doing it yourself. And the postdoc loved the robot because he could set it up at five o'clock and leave and then come back in the morning and his sample was all made, okay? Um, not very interesting to look at. So um, years ago when we started doing this a few years back, uh, we made a film which 
we made four different blocks, and there was a sacrificial layer where we made that DNA that was holding it together have a low melting temperature. Okay, that's our sacrificial layer. We can just change the salt or the temperature and melt it. And then we could release a three-layer film that we called the Oreo cookie. Um, so that then when we heated it up a little bit more, the cream filling of the Oreo would melt. And because we didn't pattern these films, they just kind of broke into these ugly looking fragments, okay, when we released them from the substrate. Um, and then when we heated them above this transition, each of these little fragments popped apart into two separate lamina with the same shape. Okay, so this is our basic demonstration that we were doing what we uh, said we would do. So now the cool thing is can we make, uh, can we pattern it? And this is actually surprisingly difficult because guess what, we couldn't use dry processing. Everything has to be wet. So we had to come up with a wet processing technology uh, for this. And uh, this, the postdoc came up with this very clever thing of using a perforated PDMS gasket, dipping the whole thing in the robotic dipper, and then the whole thing gets coated, peeling the gasket off, leaving these little films behind that look like that. Um, and they're, you know, a fraction of a millimeter long. They're not very big. Um, and then by melting that sacrificial layer, like we described before, you pop off all these little sheets, that in this case are rectangles. And as other people have said, when we pop them off, they curl up, okay? And that's because these bimorphs are also actuated by salt and temperature, okay? But then when we go back to the same salt and temperature conditions that we grew them at, they go flat again. All right. Uh, and just to remind you, they look like that, okay? So uh, they're basically like a hydrogel that's mostly, DN mostly water, some DNA, and a little bit of gold. Okay, and they're red because DNA nanoparticles, or red, gold nanoparticles are red. So to make an actuator, we take, take that linker that we had that previously just joined this to this and we add extra bases to the middle. We have a gap in the middle. Um, and then we design a DNA sequence which is complementary to that. So now when that complementary sequence isn't there, it curls up into a little random coil and the gold nanoparticles are close together. And then when I put that strand in that hybridizes, it makes a little double-stranded helix and it expands that bridge. So I can just shrink and expand that bridge a little bit. Now to be clever, I can add a little extra DNA onto the end of that so-called filler strand, and then that allows me to pull it out, okay? So if I now put in a strand which is complementary to the filler strand, it, the filler strand would rather mate with the stripper strand than stay there because it has a longer overlap, so it's lower energy. So I can just kind of alternately add filler and stripper, and I can go around in this cyclically as many times as I want, and I just generate this byproduct. Okay, um, so now, so anyway, we do, hold on, hold on, come on computer, come on, come on, there we go. So we have to simulate, ooh, it's very unhappy, come on, come on, come on, one more. Um, so we can simulate everything in computer, this nice thing about DNA, because while we haven't solved the protein folding problem, we have solved the DNA hybridization problem. So when we design all the DNA in the, in the computer, then when we build it, it works exactly the way we expect it to. Um, when we do lipsometry on these films, we get that they expand about 10%, which is consistent with what we expected. Um, and if we make up one of the, some of these films, and so this is a double active film, where we've kind of cut the corners off so we can tell the difference about which of the two films is up. Okay, so the rectangles with the corners cut. Um, when we add the strands, they curl up, okay, as we would expect. Um, now, you'll notice that they don't actually do it at the same speed because if the strand has to get into the bottom film, it actuates slower than it has to go into the top, okay? And so if we look at a movie of a dish of these things, um, and these are only slightly sped up from real time, you'll find that some of the, some of the guys will actually actuate pretty quickly, and then the other ones will go later. Okay, and then you can correlate that with their orientation. Um, now, let's see, come on. So now if we actually think about this a little bit, the expanded state has two states. It has green up or red up. When they're both contracted, which is a different chemical state, they can also be red up or green up. And then there's two curled states. There's green curled on the inside and there's red curled on the inside. And theoretically, I could curl around the long axis or I could curl around the short axis. So there's eight different distinct mechanochemical states. Um, and then after doing some experiments, we can map out this whole sort of state diagram that if I add, say, green filler to this state, it will go off and make that, right? Because films open like this, they don't open like that, all right? So what's interesting is that now we actually have like something that looks robot-like in terms of its complexity, right? We have eight different uh, states and we can actually, by adding DNA in different sequences, we can drive it to any one of these states around this diagram. And the simplest thing to do is just to get it to roll over, right? So when you have a baby, the first thing the baby does mechanically is roll over, 
Okay, so this is my baby robot, and we got it to roll over. Okay, so we were very happy. Um, if we added the DNA in a different sequence, it would sort of roll over the other way. Okay, um, and there's also a self-writing characteristic that if, it, if initially 50% of them were up and 50% of them were down, I could actually program it so they would all be up or all be down, and we were able to do that. All right, so I think I'm getting low on time. One of the interesting things is Normally, if you try to do this intrinsic strain bimorph thing to a rectangle, it always folds around the long axis because that's the lowest energy state and that's what they teach mechanical engineers. Um, and what we found is, of course, there's, a, there's an, a metastable state which is wrapped around the short axis. And we could actually access that by doing double actuation. So if we tell both films to shrink at the same time, it goes through some intermediate Pringle chip shaped state and then ends up in this sort of short axis curled state. Okay, so, there, so these, are all, these arrows are all double actuated simultaneously. And so we're able to actually access all eight states and, and walk around. Um, let's see, are they gonna go? Yeah, see, so they're rolling up around their short axes. Okay, and that's pretty much what we've got. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. Yeah, the part one ones? Yeah. What do you mean by isolate? Can you get single ones? I, I wanna know. Can I sort that them? Is, yeah. No. I'm curious if, uh, <laughs> it'd be cool to put them in the x rays like I do and, and watch them transition. Well, I guess I'm talking to a guy who's doing x rays on single colloidal crystallites. So if I can dry them down properly or freeze dry them or something and get them mounted, I think he can do that. Ah, so I said they're slightly sped up, but the problem is, which I'm sure is something that you could really appreciate, is these things are just free floating in the dish. And so if you pipette the liquid that's stimulating them in too fast, they all kind of go whoosh off to the other side of the dish. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. I so, so what he actually does is he just kind of drips the DNA on one side and then waits for it to diffuse over. That, that is exactly what I do. But the, the, uh, <laughs> so but not with DNA, but so if, you, if, you, if you just throw it in really fast, you can see them curling right away. They curl in seconds. Yeah, that's what I mean. What's the fundamental time scale? We think it's seconds. Okay, cool. And there's, I mean, in some sense, uh, you could think about even marrying the two technologies, right? If you have a, a, an object that has mm -hmm. DNA, you know, uh, handshakes coming off of it, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be a colloid. It could be something that actually mechanically actuates. Sure. Right? Yeah. Like an origami. Like an origami. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Did you also use temperature for the having the spreader come on, come on and off instead of using You know, we thought that would be easy. And it never really worked. Okay. And I think the reason why it worked didn't work is because we're simple minded. Okay? The nice thing about that whole chemical reaction cycle with the strand exchange reaction is that the energies involved are way bigger than KT. So it kind of operates very mechanically. Like everything goes to completion and then it goes to completion again. And then if you start actually going to places where things are happening by thermal excitation, it just sits in some middle state, you know, and just kind of continuously transforms or falls apart or does something more non-intuitive. Okay. Yes. Ah, oh, well, you know, we, yeah, we lost a lot of sleep over the shape of those fragments. And it turns out that the previous postdoc, not this guy, um, he liked to, he was a chemist, so he was taught to always stir his samples before he put it, before he dipped. And then there was debris, and he had little pinholes in his film. And then when it popped off the film, it got torn apart by the pinholes. And if you don't shake the sample before you dip, it come, they come out very nice and uniform with no pinholes, and they pop off as large sheets. I don't know if that, does that make sense?